Welcome to the Deep Dive. You guys wanted to know more about atoms, right? Well, get ready for a wild ride through history because we're about to take a deep dive into how our ideas about atoms have changed over time. And you wouldn't believe how many twists and turns there are in this story. Seriously, it's kind of mind blowing. We're going through this fascinating audio lecture about atomic models, and I'm already amazed by how many different ways scientists tried to imagine this tiny little building block of, well, everything. Yeah, you know, it really shows how science works, doesn't it? Each model, even the ones that seem kind of crazy now, they all played a part in getting us to where we are today. It's like putting a puzzle together, but with atoms. Exactly. Each model is like a new piece of the puzzle. Okay, so before we get too deep into these models, let's start with the basics. we got to rewind a bit to the discovery of the electron, that tiny little negatively charged particle that really shook things up, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, before that, everybody thought atoms were like the smallest possible thing, like tiny little billiard balls that couldn't be broken down any further. Right, indivisible. But then, boom! The electron shows up. Exactly. And suddenly, scientists had a whole new problem on their hands. They had to figure out where this electron fit into the picture. How do you incorporate this negatively charged particle into an atom that's supposed to be neutral overall? So that's where these early atomic models come in, right? Like, yeah. each one was trying to solve that puzzle. Exactly. It was a race to come up with the best explanation for how electrons and atoms work together. So let's talk about some of these early attempts. And honestly, some of them are pretty wild, like Kelvin's vortex model. Oh yeah, Kelvin's model is pretty out there. He imagined the atom as this swirling vortex of electrical charge, with the electron kind of trapped inside. A vortex. Yeah. I mean, where did that even come from? Well, Kelvin was a brilliant guy, worked a lot with fluid mechanics, so it makes sense he'd draw inspiration from that. Ah, so he was looking at the world around him, trying to see if any patterns would apply to the atom. Yeah, and it's not just Kelvin. Another example, Rayleigh's two fluids model. Okay, two fluids. Tell me more about that one. Rayleigh was thinking about electrical double layers, which they'd observed in electrochemistry. He imagined the atom as having these two fluids, positive and negative charges, kind of intertwined. Like mixing oil and water. Yeah, something like that. And the electron would be part of that negative fluid. So even in these early models, they were already connecting ideas from different fields, trying to see the bigger picture. Absolutely. They were pulling from whatever knowledge they had, trying to make sense of this new subatomic world. But I'm guessing these early models weren't perfect, right? They probably couldn't explain everything. Well, they had their limitations. They really struggled with explaining how atoms interact with light, for instance. Yeah, light. That's a big one. Like how atoms emit those specific colors of light instead of whole rainbow. Right. And one of the early attempts to explain that was, well, J.J. Thompson, the guy who discovered the electron, came up with this idea called the plum pudding model. The plum pudding. That's the one I remember from school. Yeah. He pictured the atom as this positively charged sphere with the electrons embedded in it, like plums in a pudding. And to explain the colors of light, he thought the electrons vibrated at different frequencies within this positive pudding. Okay, I can kind of picture that. Yeah. But I'm guessing the plum pudding model wasn't the be-all, end-all, right? It had some holes, so to speak? It did, yeah. For one thing, it couldn't explain why atoms emit those very specific colors instead of a whole spectrum. And later experiments, like Rutherford's famous gold foil experiment, show that the atom actually has a tiny, dense nucleus at its center. So the plum pudding model, while creative, didn't quite capture the whole picture. It was a step in the right direction, but it was time for something new. And that's where the Lekunar models came in. Lekunar models. Okay, the word rings a bell, but refresh my memory. What does Lekunar even mean? It means having gaps or cavities. So these models were different because they started introducing the idea of empty space within the atom. Oh, that's a big shift. Empty space within an atom. So it's not just a solid chunk of whatever it's made of. That's a whole new way of thinking about it. Yeah. It was a pretty radical idea at the time, and one of the first examples was Lennard's dynamite model. Dynamite, okay, this is getting interesting. Tell me more about this explosive model. Well, Lennard proposed that atoms were made up of pairs of positive and negative charges, which he called dynamids. And these dynamids interacted through electrostatic forces and dipole forces. So it's like tiny sticks of dynamite attracting and repelling each other. 
I can see where the name came from. Uh, yeah, but this model, uh, it had some trouble explaining certain things, like the Zeeman effect, which is how spectral lines split when you expose atoms to a magnetic field. So back to the drawing board. What came next after the dynamite? Well, around the same time, a physicist named Hendrik Lorentz developed a model that had some real success. He imagined the atom with a tiny, positively charged nucleus at the center, and the electrons were elastically bound to it. Elastically bound? Like little balls on springs bouncing around the nucleus? Exactly. And this model actually did a pretty good job of explaining things like the Zeeman effect and diamagnetism, which is when some materials are repelled by magnetic fields. Wow, so it was a step in the right direction. Did it become the main model that everyone used? It was definitely influential, but it still couldn't explain everything. For instance, there were some details about atomic spectra that it couldn't quite get right, and it didn't quite fit with some new ideas that were emerging about the quantization of energy. Quantization of energy, okay. That sounds like we're about to enter a whole new chapter in this atomic saga. You got it! Thanks. That's where things get really interesting. Here, wait. Okay, so we've journeyed through swirling vortexes and dynamite sticks, even plum pudding. But it sounds like none of these models truly cracked the code of the atom. Yeah, they were all missing a key piece of the puzzle. You mentioned that physicists were starting to question whether classical physics could explain everything happening at the atomic level. So what was the missing piece? What were they struggling with? Well, one of the biggest challenges was explaining how atoms interact with light. You see, if electrons were just little particles orbiting a nucleus like planets around the sun, they should be constantly emitting radiation as they accelerate. Okay, that makes sense. Moving charges create electromagnetic waves. Exactly. But that radiation should cover a wide range of frequencies, meaning atoms should emit a continuous spectrum of light, like a rainbow. So atoms should be glowing with all the colors, not just specific ones. Right. But that's not what scientists were actually seeing. Yeah, you keep mentioning these specific colors of light that atoms emit and absorb. Why was that detail so important? What did it tell them? Those specific colors, or spectral lines, implied that something was restricting the electron's energy. It was like they could only exist at certain specific energy levels within the atom, like climbing a staircase. You can't stand halfway between two steps. So the atom was starting to look less like a miniature solar system mm. and more like uh, a quantized staircase. Oh, that's a great way to put it. And this idea of quantization, where energy comes in discrete packets instead of a smooth, continuous flow, was revolutionary. It was one of the first hints that the rules governing the atomic world were fundamentally different from those of the macroscopic world. Okay, so who was the first to really venture into this strange new quantum territory? Well, several physicists began exploring these ideas in the early 1900s. Richard Gans, for example, tried incorporating quantized energy levels into existing models. But the real breakthrough came with Niels Bohr. Ah, Bohr. The name I actually remember from high school chemistry. Electrons orbiting in those neat little circles, but only at specific distances from the nucleus, right? That's the one. Bohr's model was this ingenious blend of classical physics and these new quantum ideas. He kept the planetary structure of Rutherford's model, but added the crucial element of quantized energy levels. So did Bohr's model finally explain those distinct colors of light? It did. He proposed that electrons could only exist in certain allowed orbits, each with a specific energy level. And when an electron jumped from a higher energy level to a lower one, it emitted a photon of light with a very specific frequency corresponding to one of those spectral lines. Okay, so the electron jumps down a step on the staircase, and that releases a photon of a specific color. Exactly. Like, each step on the staircase has a specific color associated with it. But why did the electrons jump between those orbits in the first place? What was the driving force behind these quantum leaps. That's the thing. Bohr's model didn't really explain why the electrons behaved this way. It just stated that they did, and the math worked out beautifully. It was a kind of leap of faith that paid off big time. So Bohr's model was a major step forward, but it still had some loose ends. Did other physicists try to refine his model and fill in those gaps? Absolutely. Several physicists jumped on board, eager to build on Bohr's foundation. Lars Vegard, for one, and then Arnold Sommerfeld, they both made the model even more accurate. How so? What did they change or add to the model? Well, they incorporated elliptical orbits, not just circular ones. 
and they started considering relativistic effects. Because, remember, Einstein's theory of special relativity was also shaking things up at the time. And they even factored in the motion of the nucleus, which Bohr had initially ignored. Wow, so they were adding more and more layers of complexity to the model. And I guess that makes sense, because the atom is a pretty complex thing. Right. And all these refinements were getting us closer and closer to a truly accurate picture of the atom. So we've been focusing on physicists trying to unravel the inner workings of the atom. But what about the chemists? Weren't they busy figuring out how atoms interact with each other? That's a great point. Remember Gilbert Lewis? He was the one with the cube model we talked about earlier. Yeah, the one that didn't quite work out. Right. But Lewis, along with a bunch of other chemists, were very interested in understanding how atoms come together to form molecules. So while the physicists were delving into the atom's core, the chemists were focused on the practical side of how atoms interact and create all the different substances we see around us. Exactly. And this led to some really interesting models specifically designed to explain chemical bonding. Okay, I'm curious to hear about these chemical bonding models. Which one came first? One of the most influential early models was the ionic model proposed by Walther Kossel. He was focused on ionic bonds, which form when one atom donates an electron to another, creating two ions with opposite charges that attract each other. Oh, so it's like magnets where opposites attract, like with table salt, where you have sodium and chloride ions sticking together. Perfect analogy, the positive sodium ion and the negative chloride ion are attracted to each other, forming an ionic bond. That makes a lot of sense. So what about covalent bonds, where atoms share electrons? Well, that's where the Lewis-Langmuir model comes in, developed by, you guessed it, Gilbert Lewis and Irving Langmuir. They specifically focused on how atoms share electrons to form those covalent bonds. Hold on, Lewis dot structures, the ones we had to learn in chemistry class. Are those connected to this model? Absolutely. Lewis dot structures are a direct representation of the lewis langmuir model. They visually show how electrons are shared between atoms in a molecule. It's all coming back to me now. So Lewis, even though his cube model didn't pan out, he still made significant contributions to understanding chemical bonding. He was a real pioneer in the field. But even the lewis langmuir model, as groundbreaking as it was, had its limitations. By 1922, Wolfgang Pauli, a brilliant Austrian physicist, demonstrated that it couldn't accurately predict bond energies, which are crucial for understanding chemical reactions. I mean, even though it was a big leap forward, it wasn't the complete picture. Right. It was still missing some key elements. And to really understand bond energies and other intricate details of chemical bonding, we need to move into the realm of quantum mechanics. Oh, yes. Quantum mechanics. Yeah. yeah. We left off on that cliffhanger before the break. Yeah. So that's the next big turning point, right? The next level of understanding the atom. It it is. And get ready for a whole new way of thinking about the atom. Quantum mechanics changes everything. Okay, we're back and I'm ready to dive headfirst into the quantum realm. You were saying that quantum mechanics basically revolutionized how we understand the atom. I have to admit, the quantum part still makes me a little nervous. Is this where things start getting really, really complicated? Well, it can seem a bit daunting at first, yeah. But trust me, it's super fascinating once you wrap your head around it. And the good news is, Quantum mechanics doesn't just toss out all those older models we talked about. It actually gives us a new framework to understand them in a deeper way. Okay, that makes me feel a little better. Yeah. So what is this new framework? How does quantum mechanics change our view of the atom? The big shift is this. Quantum mechanics says that electrons, they don't actually behave like tiny little planets orbiting the sun. Instead, they act more like waves. Wait, waves? Like waves in the ocean. Kind of. Think of it as a wave of probability spread out over space. And to describe these wave-like electrons, we use a mathematical equation called the Schrodinger equation, named after physicist Erwin Schrodinger. Okay, the Schrodinger equation. Got it. But if electrons are acting like waves, does that mean they're not orbiting the nucleus in those neat little circles anymore? Exactly. The quantum mechanical picture of the atom is much fuzzier, much less defined than the Bohr model. Instead of those precise orbits, we now have these fuzzy, cloud-like regions called orbitals. Orbitals, okay. Hmm. So are these orbitals like the areas where the electron waves are the strongest? You got it. Orbitals are regions of space where the probability of finding an electron is the highest. It's not that the electron is literally buzzing around in that space like a bee, it's that its wave-like nature is most pronounced in those regions. So it's all about probability now. 
We can't say for sure exactly where an electron is at any given moment, just the likelihood of finding it in a certain area. Exactly. It's like trying to pinpoint the location of a bee buzzing around a flower garden. You can't say exactly where it is at any given moment, but you can map out the areas where it's most likely to be, right? Right. Makes sense. But what about those quantized energy levels that Bohr proposed? Does that idea still hold true in this fuzzy, wave-like world of quantum mechanics? It absolutely does. In fact, the Schrödinger equation actually explains those quantized energy levels. The math shows that electrons can only exist in specific energy states, just like Bohr said. It's just that those energy states now correspond to these three-dimensional probability clouds, the orbitals, instead of those neat little circular orbits. So the quantum mechanical model, even though it's more abstract and fuzzy, actually explains Bohr's observations in a deeper way. It's like Bohr discovered a key that opened a door and then Schrodinger came along and figured out the mechanism of the lock. Exactly, and that's a great way to think about it. But it doesn't stop there. You see, the Schrodinger model is the most well-known and widely used, especially for understanding chemical bonding. But physicists, they've also developed even more sophisticated models, like the Dirac equation and the Klein-Gordon equation, that incorporate both quantum mechanics and Einstein's theory of special relativity. Whoa, relativity? So now we're talking about electrons moving super fast, close to the speed of light. You got it. When you're dealing with particles moving that fast, relativistic effects become really important. And these more advanced models, they take those effects into account, which allows us to get even more accurate descriptions of some atomic phenomena. So it's like a whole hierarchy of atomic models, each one building on the previous ones and getting closer and closer to the truth. That's a great way to think about it. But here's the thing. There isn't really one correct model. It's not about one model being right and the others being wrong. So if there's no one right model, how do you decide which one to use? Well, it depends on what you're trying to understand. If you want to explain the basics of atomic structure, like the spectrum of hydrogen, Bohr's model is still a great starting point. But for more complex atoms, and especially for understanding chemical bonding, we need the power of quantum mechanics, which means using the Schrodinger model. And if we're dealing with really high energies and relativistic effects, well, that's when we bring in the big guns, the Dirac or Klein-Gordon equations. So it's kind of like having a toolbox with each atomic model serving a different purpose depending on the task at hand. Exactly. It's about using the right tool for the job. And the most important thing to remember is that our understanding of the atom is still evolving. Who knows what new models and theories might be developed in the future? That's actually pretty exciting. It means there's still so much we don't know about this tiny little building block of our universe. Exactly. And that's the beauty of science. There's always more to learn, more mysteries to unravel. Well, this deep dive has certainly sparked a new level of curiosity in me about the atom. And I have to say, I'm kind of blown away by how much our understanding has evolved over time. From those early, almost whimsical models to the complexities of quantum mechanics, it's been an incredible journey. I agree. It really highlights the power of human curiosity and our drive to understand the world around us, even at the smallest scales. And to all our listeners out there, never lose that curiosity. Keep asking questions, keep exploring, keep learning. You never know what amazing discoveries might be waiting just around the corner. Who knows, maybe one of you listening right now will be the next Bohr or Schrodinger, pushing the boundaries of our understanding of the atom even further. And that concludes our deep dive into the fascinating world of atomic models. Thanks for joining us on this incredible journey.